Hello, and welcome to The Distillery. I'm your host, Harry Li Shanglun, and today we have special guest Grace Crowley joining us. Uh, Grace is a competition climber. How are you doing, Grace? Yeah, I'm pretty good. How are you? I am doing well. I just finished shucking some oysters, so my hands smell of seafood, uh, which you can't tell, but I've just told everyone. Uh, what did you get up to today? Um, you know, went and got some coffee from the Urban Climb Cafe, and then had a climbing session at my home wall. It's pretty good. Wow. Uh, Urban Climb is the gym that we both frequent, and actually, I I think I met you either there or Northside Boulders. Yeah, um, I think it was there. And I've only been climbing for, uh, for six months now, but you've been climbing for quite a lot longer. Yeah, I think four, four and a half years now. How did you get into it? I had a family friend that used to climb, and then a gym opened up at the town I used to live in and started climbing with her. Where, whereabouts was this? Uh, in Montana, in the US. Okay, cool. And so you started climbing over there and uh, and then came over to Australia and somehow you're now, uh, I mean, you're brilliant at the sport. You're really good at it. Thank um, you. How did you find that journey of starting out and then getting to where you are now? Yeah, I just just fell in love with climbing, like from that first time going and I just kept doing it and then I moved here and I'm pretty sure it was like the first thing I found was a climbing gym like before I chose a school I found a climbing gym and a climbing gym. <laughs> get your priorities correct yeah uh I'm really interested in the differences of the different types of climbing because uh I wasn't aware of it going in I had no idea uh that there's actually different things that you can do but you compete in uh, three different sports that are all under the same branch or like all considered climbing. Can you tell us about those three different sports? Yeah. So there's bouldering, speed climbing and lead climbing. Uh, lead climbing is like the taller walls and you tie into a rope before you go up and clip the rope in as you go up the wall with a belayer catching you if you fall. And then speed climbing has a standardized route, which is always the same all around the world. And then you practice it like a million times and get faster and that's head to head in competitions. And bouldering has shorter walls with mats underneath you for when you fall to protect your landing. It's generally harder, but shorter climbs than lead climbing. Right. So lead climbing with rope, very tall, speed climbing, same route over and over again, bouldering, shorter lower roots but very hard yes is that okay that, what is what's your favorite of the three i really like bouldering and speed climbing it's probably a tie okay what make what aspects are you uh, excited by in those sports um i really like the problem solving and the sort of like short nature of bouldering like trying the same climb a few times and trying to figure it out within that time limit of a competition and then speed climbing um sort of got an interesting mental aspect of you've done the route a million times but like it could all fail with like one slip and then you're just done that sounds like so much pressure yeah it is a little bit <laughs> how do you deal with that how do you train for the moment of a competition where you know that you can do it because you've done it and then you just have to like do it yeah um sort of have to get in that same headspace as you would be in a competition while you're training so like going like a hundred percent every single run and trying to push it faster and faster and faster every time like take those risks that you will take in a competition during mm. training so you're actually not just practicing like the physical uh, thing, you're, you're practicing your headspace at the same time. Yeah, definitely. And then you mentioned like the problem solving aspects of bouldering. Uh, can you talk us through that? Yeah, so in a, in a like World Cup competition style round of bouldering, you get five minutes to try one boulder. And then there's like five or four boulders. So you have that one boulder and you have to try and 
figure out the right beta and execute every like within that five minutes. And when you say right beta, what does that mean? So like the right way to do it, um, how you're going to get up the climb without falling a million times. <laughs> the thing that struck me uh, about bordering as soon as I started doing it was it felt very dialogic as if though there's some, you know, person speaking to you through the pattern or the design. Yeah. Um, do you feel like when you're in the competition, like cursing out the designer or the setter of the problem? Do you... <laughs> Yeah, definitely sometimes. Uh, does that make you a good setter yourself? Have you tried setting roots and making problems? Um, I make up problems on like a spray wall, which just has like a whole bunch of different holds on it that are always there. Um, I like doing that, but I've never tried like commercial setting or anything. Hmm. Maybe in the future. Um, yeah, that's a whole avenue to explore. Yeah. What, what's, what makes for a really good problem in bouldering? Um, definitely the movement is to me the most important part. Like if it feels smooth and it feels natural while still being hard, it's important to me. And then in competition, aesthetics do come into play because of photography and media and everything. Huh. Okay. Wait, so like such, uh, making it so that the move is, looks good or that the arrangement of holds look good. Yeah, both. Like, you don't want to climb that's going to be, like, super boring to watch on a live stream or that's going to look really ugly in your photos. <laughs> this is the first time that climbing, and, and actually it's all three disciplines we talked about, is represented in the Olympics. Yeah. Um, and something that always strikes me as funny or interesting is when sports come into that kind of global awareness, uh, they have to do a lot of work to make the make it more accessible, make it more consumable and understandable to a general audience. And, and sometimes that changes the very nature of the sport itself. Um, do you know that's happened in the history of climbing? Like, has, has climbing evolved to become more spectator friendly or to, to change its style over time? Yeah, I think right now the like style of competition climbing has changed to be more exciting and more dynamic in the, in the movements, which... Some people think it's good, some think it's bad, but it's just changing. And when, when you say more dynamic in the motions, uh, what does that mean for a non-climber? Um, so like more jumping and more bigger moves with more excitement rather than slower, just pulling on small holds that you can't really see from the crowd. <laughs> right, okay. So it's like visually more exciting because you're doing these dramatic things. Yeah. Uh, I've seen you do some dinos. Like, it's pretty cool to watch. I, I really enjoy watching you fly through the air. Um, and, what, you know, your relationship to, uh, you're, you're preparing for a bunch of competitions. Do you want to be competing in the Olympics? And what's your training program like for that? Yeah, I think definitely someday I'd like to compete in the Olympics. I think 2020 is, or 2021, it's a little unrealistic for me right now. So maybe 2024, but eventually, someday, maybe. Yeah, um, uh, we'll be rooting for you if you do. Thank you. My training right now, it's a little, little wacky. Just got a competition. The next one confirmed is in December. So it's quite a ways out. Mm. Um, but normally, I would be training to peak for each competition and training like my training cycles so that I'm peaking like for each competition rather than just constantly training and being in peak form all the time. Right. So you're, um, you're recognizing that, that there is a progression where you're accelerating, uh, improving, and then there's a peak and then you can actually fall away from that peak. Yeah. If you like train for too long or get out of cycle. Yeah. Uh, what does that feel like? Um, it feels really good when you're at peak form, you just generally feel strong, but if you sort of hit like past that and start overtraining, it feels, you just kind of feel weak and pathetic all the time, every session. Man, I must just always be past peak. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I peaked early. And 
Uh, so now that your training has been disrupted because of COVID-19, what are you doing in this like extended downtime before your next competition in December? Yeah, just mostly training. I'll update my training plan like every six to eight weeks so that I'm not hitting that downward after the peak. So instead of having a competition at the peak, I'll just change what I'm doing and train differently. So mm, that yep. hopefully always going up and getting stronger. So good. Um, I'd love to also ask uh, back kind of on speed climbing because it seems like such a different thing. Uh, yeah. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's climbing, but you're in my head. It's like, oh, it's just, you, 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 you don't have to problem solve. You take risks um, that you know, the percentage of whether they're going to pass or fail, it sounds like. Um, yeah, sort of. So you, in training, you sort of want to dial those moves down so that they're the lowest risk they can be while still pushing yourself to go faster every single time, which is a risk in itself. Yeah. And it's not quite like running because there is this chance of like failure at any given moment, which you cannot recover from. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's, that's so dramatic. Um, have you ever, this is maybe a painful question, like have you ever failed in a critical moment? Yeah, I think there's certainly been competitions, well, a lot of competitions where you just like, you sort of psych yourself out and your start goes wrong and you just can't recover. And that just sort of means that that run is like, if you've missed the first hold, that runs like, done and you you just can't recover enough to catch up to the person next to you mm. right because you're actually even though you're competing against everyone it's like kind of presented as a 1v1 thing yeah so in the qualifications you'll you're just going for time but you'll still be racing next to someone you just want the fastest time but then in finals it's head-to-head -head knockout oh okay so brackets actually matter it sounds like it in the competition, but not yeah. in the not in the qualifications, but they do in finals. Oh man, I have so many like game designy curious thoughts about all this. Um we actually have some live comments. Uh Esther from our gym has commented on YouTube, yes, please don't change climbing <laughs> in response to our conversation about uh I guess like traditional versus modern styles of bouldering. So some contention amongst Ooh. climbers, it sounds like. Drama. No parkour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so if you have failed, if, if you have like messed up your start and you know that you're not going to go, uh, I have two questions. One of like, it, one of which is what then happens if you mess up your start and you know that it's not going to go well, but you're inside it anyway? And then the second question is how do you deal with the psychological impact and not tilt for future or... Um, like, how do you pick yourself up from that place? Um, I think to answer your first question, um, if you sort of fail in a move, you just have to keep going and you, like, you can't stop, you can't slow down, even if it's not right. You just have to keep going because there's always the chance that the person next to you is going to slip and they're going to fall or they're going to, like, slow down. And if you just keep going as fast as you can, there's a chance you could catch up if they make a mistake. So that sort of just don't want to stop, even if you make a mistake. Yeah. And then the second question is not as much of an issue. If it's like in, if it's your second qualification run and you've had a good first one, it's not such an issue to recover because you know that you've had a good run that day and you're capable of it. But when it's like your practice runs or your first qualification run that you fail on, it's kind of hard to recover because you start doubting yourself or you don't know if you're at the top of your game that day. You just sort of have to put mm. all that out of your mind and try and do, try and do it. Do you have any and practical that, um, techniques or tips for that? Or is it just a, just do it? Um, yeah, I like to go over the route, like, like, read it a million times. 
every every time I do it. And then also like breathing and changing my headspace and putting it all out of my mind. Like the last run didn't happen. It didn't matter. It's done now. And only the next one matters. Mm. What are your strongest memories from climbing um, over the four or so years that you've fallen in love with the sport? Hmm. What do you mean by that? Like, uh, like, do you, when, when you look back at climbing and, and kind of consider it as this object that you've placed so much attention and care and time into, um, what are the things that you really get out of it? You know, is it like, oh, I remember the feeling of winning or the feeling of training or, you know, what are the things that really stick out to you? I guess, looking, looking at it as a whole. Um, yeah, probably like the feeling of that success, either in training and like topping a boulder that was really hard or getting a new PB in speed, like that success in training and then translating it into a competition and doing well in a competition and getting fast times. That's it's pretty, pretty big. It's like a big head rush. You're addicted yeah. to it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what advice do you have for someone like me who's not climbing on a competition level uh, but still wants to get better at this sport? Yeah, I think there's like a lot of things that you can take from competition climbing, like the way that we train specifically, like mentally, that will help with just your climbing for fun in a gym or climbing outdoors, like training to try really hard every single attempt and push yourself even if it's like a really hard boulder and you're not comfortable on it. That 100% mindset you were talking about earlier is something that I felt only once or twice and they were really good training session days. Yeah. Uh, but usually I don't even call them training session days. I'm just like, oh, I'm just mucking around on a wall. It's really yeah. fun. <laughs> um, what about people who have never climbed? People who might be listening into this in the future or now uh, who are like, oh, the climbing sounds really fun, but that's, I don't know if it's for me. Do you have any thoughts for them? Yeah, um, just give it a shot. It's probably going to be really hard because it's always really hard. And just trying things maybe outside your comfort zone is going to make you better, even if it's like the easiest grade in the gym or if it's the hardest grade in the gym. It's always going to make you better. That's a really nice takeaway for things outside of climbing as well. Like, try things outside your comfort zone. Go hard. Yeah. There you go. Climbing is teaching us life, important life lessons. For sure. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, questions about uh, other things. This Sunday, there is a morning tea, uh, which you're presenting at. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. The Climbing Cuties Idaho Hobbit morning tea, which I'm presenting. Climbing Cuties is a queer climbing group focused on representation and inclusivity of climbing. Nice. And uh, what is what are you going to talk about at this Ida Hobbit morning tea? Um, there's quite a few other presenters. I don't have all their names off the top of my head, but they're pretty <laughs> That's cool all right. people. People, I'm sure up. people can can look it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look it up. It's on the Climbing Cuties Facebook, Instagram website, everything. Um, yeah, we're just going to talk about, everybody's going to talk about whatever they want, stories, talking about inclusivity and diversity. Yeah. And, um, what are the things, uh, I guess, like, what do we want to see in terms of diversity and inclusivity in climbing? Obviously we want to see more of that, but, uh, like, have, have you any, uh, insight into the specific history of this community and the way that it has become more inclusive over time? Um, I don't know any specific history, but in my personal experience, I found that there's like not a whole lot of publicly out queer climbers. And I would like there to be more because role models are important and it's important to have somebody to look up to that's maybe like you in a way that's not just a climber. 
Right. So it's uh, like by bringing different identities and uh, backgrounds uh, t together into climbing, then there's better role models or people that you can look up to when you're just starting out, not just as a climber, but as a person. Is that the yes, gist of what that's you're saying? A, it's a much better way to put it. I'm muddling through this. This is <laughs> the process of distillation, but actually I just <laughs> try to reword whatever's being said. Um, and are, I mean, you are kind of leading the way in that way, right? As um, somebody who is uh, a, an openly queer climber and there are others also in Australia doing the same uh, thing, right? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's quite a few of us more than you might think. It's... Do you, climbing QTs is uh, huge, by the way. Like um, last time that I went to one of their events, there was literally hundreds of people. Yeah. Uh, and that's really encouraging to see. Why is it so important that there is um, that sense of community uh, amongst queer climbers? Like, um, I think the climbing gym can often be like a pretty intimidating place. There's like often like a lot of strong people that, might not be wearing shirts or might look <laughs> intimidating and be climbing harder than you. I think it's important to have a community that will support you and has varying different abilities that you can sort of hang around and you'll always have someone, whether they're the same ability or different ability to you, that's like a friendly face and that you can climb with. Nice. So that sense of community helps people feel more welcome and more comfortable um, in a place that might be traditionally quite masculine or unwelcoming. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think the shirts off issue is really interesting because I have taken my shirt off at a climbing gym. I've committed the cardinal sin um, twice now in my life. Both were very hot days. That's I'm just gonna... <laughs> that's that's my excuse. Um, but. It is something that uh, I've heard being discussed and have discussed with other people in climbing communities. Like, what are the elements of climbing culture that we want to reject or distance ourselves from that might have existed in the past? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I know that there's like quite a few gyms. Like, I don't know about specifically in Australia, but all over the world, there's like gyms that require you to wear a shirt or something like that and so that sort of changes that vibe that you have in that gym on depending on if that gym requires you to wear a shirt or something like that esther just commented on youtube yes keep your shirt on and i, I suspect it was directed at me <laughs> uh, but she also says put colorful leggings on instead uh, I mean, which I do not yeah. own, so, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think I do either. Don't know if I own any leggings, but. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not, this is something I noticed about uh, bouldering that really struck me uh, both figuratively and literally. Uh, I get all sorts of scrapes and bruises and cuts like everywhere. Yeah. Um, wh what? <laughs> I didn't realize this like was a contact sport. Contact with the wall, it'll it'll mess you up. And so I'm seriously considering just like investing in some sort of giant morph suit to, <laughs> to boulder in or something that'll just prevent me from scraping all my skin off. You could just wear a shirt and some pants that generally prevent scrape. <laughs> yeah, but where's the fun in that? <laughs> Good point. I, I also started bouldering in jeans, not to show off, but because I got lazy and forgot to bring shorts. Um, I've been there, yeah. Done that. It... <laughs> it's like either a very pro move or an incredibly novice move, which I think reflects the, the relative uh, skill difference between us. It's definitely both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah simultaneously. It's like showing <laughs> off and also uh, showing, <laughs> showing off. Hmm. What are you excited for in the world of climbing in the years to come? Ooh, everything. Just more climbing. <laughs> I, for you, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, more, more. I need it. More. Uh, but like, 
uh, more broadly, like not just to do with how you relate to it, but I guess how climbing itself is going to evolve and change. Uh... Yeah, I think it's definitely going to become more like mainstream, I guess. Definitely more like pe more people are going to know about it. There's going to be more gyms opening up and a bigger community with more people at the gyms and more people at the competitions and more people outside and just more people involved. And mm. I think that's going to change it probably for the better. Nice. Well, why will it change it for the better? I mean, who doesn't want more friends? Just more people to climb with. That's a really lovely answer. Um, and then conversely, what do you think of the challenges that climbing faces or even specifically like speed or bouldering or lead um i think there's definitely going to be like issues with competitions like specifically the olympics of which disciplines they include like 2020 2021 olympics they're they've combined it to a three discipline event so every athlete has to do speed bouldering and lead and maybe in the future they'll split it um, so you're saying that yeah, even if one. an athlete only does one or two at the moment they actually have to get good at all three to win yeah yeah there's like a multiplication where your ranking is multiplied to give you a combined ranking and that sort of changes like who's gonna win because you're either like really good at speed or you're really good at lead or you're really good at bouldering and you're not necessarily good at all three so that changes the whole competition it's so fascinating um because it, on one hand climbing is such a naturalistic sport like here's an object climb it is it seems like something that a human could do at any stage of human development uh sorry i don't mean that in the piaget sense of like an embryo can do it i meant that in the sense of like we probably as humans have been doing this for ages yeah. uh whereas curling like oh maybe is more recent I don't know why I chose curling. Uh, <laughs> and I also don't know anything about the history of curling, so I don't know why I chose that. But then, like, it, it sounds like climbers are going to have to do weird maths about, oh, I need to invest this much time into this discipline because the factor of multiplication is this. And um, I have to yeah. get good at parkour because the style of setting is this. So, like, it, it's very much a, a modern sport in that sense. Yeah, certainly. There's a lot of different multiplication of and a lot of different sort of theories on whether it's better to be pretty good at all three or better to be really good at one and pretty good at two or really good at two and not good at the third. And like the training aspect of balancing all three while trying not to not get injured and everything. Balancing uh, and so as a final question, what's your answer to that multiplication problem? How do you split your attention? Ooh, I think... I definitely focus on bouldering and speed all the time. And then just like right leading up to the competition, I'll start doing a little bit of lead just to get that fitness up for the long routes. And that's, that's how I split it. Massive endurance. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Grace, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you about all things climbing. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah. Uh, take care and see you on the wall when it all opens up again. Yeah, thank you. That was Grace Crowley. And this is The Distillery. Thanks so much for tuning in. You can, oh, you can definitely follow Grace on Instagram. Uh, their Instagram uh, handle is Grace Crowley, but the E and Y of her name has been swapped. So do pay attention to that. And you can also follow The Distillery on Instagram at distillery.site and on Twitter at distillery site and the website distillery.site. I will get better at that ending spiel at some point. But it's been a pleasure to talk uh, with all of our guests so far, and we've got so many more lined up, so do check back because new episodes are streamed daily. Take care, everyone. Good night.